should have me on one and my computer on the other at this point. Just a minute. I'll get you on camera one. There you go. All right. I Sorry it takes so long. That's okay. Appreciate your help. Take the picture and picture off of it. Okay. So we've been talking about PowerPoint. Wait. That's we lost it. I don't know what happened, but it lost it. Now we got you. Let me try to get a picture and picture up here. Okay, now we're ready. Okay, thank you. We've been talking about PowerPoint. And uh, yesterday, I think we covered extra Tuesday. I think it is yesterday, but it's Tuesday. We covered quite a bit of material on things to do, things not to do, uh, how to deal with some issues. I do want to show you since the beginning, and uh, we have a couple of minutes. Uh, I mentioned things spinning and things moving. I want to show you this PowerPoint because I think it really is important for you to see how moving things can really be an irritant. Uh, now, again, not all of these things weren't on one slide like they are now, um, but they are all from PowerPoint presentations that I have had the unfortunate pleasure of sitting through. Uh, this is the one that I thought was particularly interesting. <laughs> what kind of art? Now, I need you to understand that this slide was on the screen for probably five or six minutes, which seems like an eternity. And the point that I like to make is, I, you know, if, if I'm teaching, if I'm standing up, if I'm somewhere about here, try to keep your focus on me for any length of time. I mean, you can't, this, your peripheral vision, it just drives you crazy. After a while, it's kind of like the Chinese water torture. After a while, you just have to look. Um, and there's nothing new there is the problem. It's still just the same spinning heart. And again, my question is, what kind of heart do you have? I don't know, one that's beating, not spinning. What, I, I mean... It just doesn't make sense. And so be really careful with things that move and spin and that kind of stuff, especially in an environment like this where you just let it sit there <laughs> while you're talking. It, it is a distraction. People are not paying attention to you uh, at this point. They're trying to figure out what on earth they're looking at and why they're looking at it. Yeah. Can you go over that whole spiel again without the heart? I was paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you want to go chase the slide, please. Yeah, you got it. I mean, eventually you want to stand up in the pew and just scream, stop it. Yeah, I, mean, I, I actually experienced one that was even worse, and it was it was a, a kind of an animated character that would make faces. Right. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. That drove a, me crazy. I, you know, this is dangerous to even tell you. But there are entire websites full of animated GIF files that you can download. And they all do something weird, you know, nonstop. It's just, uh, it's just sickening. And I was really pleased to discover that the new PowerPoint for the Mac prohibits animated GIFs from running. They don't, they don't spin. You can use the graphics, 
uh, but it only takes the first frame of the graphic and will not animate, which, way to go Macintosh, they, I, you know, they finally figured out that those things are so annoying that they needed to stop it. Um, we've talked a lot about things to do, things not to do. Today I want to start to deal with uh, mechanics. Things like that. Doesn't that look attractive? Um, why on earth is that? <laughs> we should have tested this out before we... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe more Yeah. I thought that was your example. Yeah, that is my example. Here's how not to do things. And since this is the same file that I used yesterday, it should work. But um, should and do are two different things. I want to start to talk a little bit about some mechanics. Uh, I, I don't have the opportunity or uh, the time to walk you through a lot of step-by-step -step in PowerPoint, this is how you do things. We're going to do a little bit of that today. But the problem is that there are different versions of PowerPoint out there. And so how you do it in one is different from how you do it in another. So I can show you how to set the background to an image in one program, the one that I'm using, but if your version is different, you got to figure out where those commands are in your version. And so it, it gets a little weird. So I'm going to try to deal with things more conceptually. We're going to do some mechanics, uh, some specific how-to kinds of things, but I want to deal at least with, in theory, why we're doing what we're doing. How it actually functions in your version of PowerPoint is another thing. While we're talking about that, PowerPoint has become like Kleenex. And this is a pet peeve of mine. Uh, it, it's, it's my own little deal. When you need a, a Kleenex, what do you really need? Tissue. You need a tissue. You don't need a Kleenex. Kleenex is a brand name. PowerPoint is a brand name. It's not, that thing hanging on the ceiling is not a PowerPoint. And I get people say that. You know, do you guys have a PowerPoint? <laughs> what do you mean? Well, you know, a PowerPoint. I want to do my sermon in PowerPoint. Do you guys have a PowerPoint? A projector? Yeah, that's what I mean. So start to use the terminology correctly. The other thing is that there are other tools to do this with. Just because you're making a visual presentation doesn't necessarily mean that you have to use PowerPoint. There are other programs that will do the same thing. What you're doing is a presentation. You're not really making a PowerPoint, unless you're doing it in PowerPoint. Um, so try to use the terminology correctly when you can. But also know that there are other alternatives out there. On the Mac side, there's a product called Keynote that is very good. I still think PowerPoint had, the program PowerPoint by Microsoft has uh, is the most mature product and, and is certainly the, the most widely used. So if you're going to do this, when you start to leave PowerPoint for other software, understand that you put the burden more on yourself if you're going to some other congregation. Um, you better, I mean, if you decided to use Keynote on a Mac, you better understand that when you get to some other congregation, odds are they don't have Keynote. So you're going to have to be prepared for that. Take your own projector, take your own laptop, whatever the case may be. When you're doing PowerPoint, when you're doing a presentation, uh, there are different types of slides that you need to think of. You know, so often we kind of just deal with things as a one size fits all. And there are really three different types of slides that I think you need to consider. First is a title slide. How many of you have heard the phrase, you can't judge a book by its cover? Well, guess what? People do it all the time. Uh, that's why the publishing industry spends millions and millions of dollars on a book jacket design, is because people judge books by their covers all the time. Now, that phrase is that you can't judge a book by its cover because you don't know what's inside. And that's true. <coughs> but we do. And the same thing happens with your PowerPoint. People are going to judge your book by its cover. Your first slide, when you start your presentation, needs to have some pop to it. 
it needs to have some, some sense of uh, pizzazz, if you will, to get their attention and get them interested. We're going to look at some samples of, of title slides in just a second. The second one is you need a, a slide that is just a basic information slide. This is where you're going to put material. Now, just because I say basic doesn't mean that it needs to be a blank white slide, okay? But you need to have a slide, a format, a template for just basic information, where you're going to put bullet points and that kind of thing. And then third is I think you need a third type of slide, and that is one where you're going to put Bible quotes. Now, the basic information slide and the Bible quote slide can probably be the same thing, um, but I, I do like to, to make the suggestion that when you're quoting from Scripture, that you give it its own slide, that it, that it has a layout that's consistent so that you can keep people going back to that same thing. When they see that graphic or when they see that template, they know that what you're doing is, is representing the Bible text. So let's start with uh, the importance of title slides. Uh, one of the reasons why Denny has dropped this class is because of his next 30 seconds. Um, Denny, <laughs> title slides set a stage for your presentation. And Denny does a wonderful three-day seminar called Fulfill Prophecy. And I got the opportunity to go see it one time. And his title slide <laughs> was that. I think it's great. I know. I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> the acorn doesn't fall far from the tree. Um, this was his title slide, and he was, you know, he, uh, Dr. Denny Petrillo. He's here to talk to us about fulfilled prophecy. He's got a background. He's got a PhD. They're giving this wonderful introduction, and this is the hook to get everything started. So when I came home, it was like, I can't ever let you do that again. <laughs> so I made him a title slide. <laughs> and it actually has images from throughout his uh, presentation, uh, the Cyrus Cylinder and, and uh, some of the archaeological ruins that he talks about in his seminar, all in that image. But at least it gives a little bit more pizzazz, a little bit more interest to the audience to say, okay, we're going to talk about something really cool today. Now, when, whenever I start to use terms like it's really cool, I, I worry. I, I need to have this disclaimer. It's not all about cool, right? I mean, we know that. I know that too. Uh, but creating visual interest is important. I mean, you've got to get your audience engaged. You've got to give them some reason to want to go down the river. You remember the, the example I used in L&R about your introduction in, in your papers. You need to give people a reason to get in your boat. they got to want to travel with you, right? Well, this doesn't give me a whole lot of reason to get in the boat. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, you know, yes, it says exactly what it means, uh, but it, there's just no visual interest here. And judging a book by its cover, what am I going to expect is coming? Awesomeness. Awesomeness, yeah. <laughs> right. That's exactly what I would think when I see a white slide filled with Helvetica text. You, you're not expecting a lot of polish, are you? You're expecting some pretty dry material coming. Whereas here, it's got a professional look to it. It's got a nice feel. This is going to be a professional presentation. I, this, this is something that I'm going to be interested in. Here's another title slide. Now, this one I just downloaded off the Internet. There are places that you can go and occasionally we'll turn around and look at the monitor in the back, too. Um, just every now and then, as, as you look at these slides, glance at the monitor in the back, because the monitor in the back really has a much more powerful image. You don't really pick up the red as much. Uh, up front here. It still looks good, though. Yeah, it's clean. It, you know, it's got a professional look to it. Now, this this particular series, The Cross, is a PowerPoint template that I downloaded from a website. I think it cost me five bucks. There are places that you can go that you can get free templates, and typically they contain a title slide, 
and then a basic information slide. Um, there are places that you can get them for free. There are places where they charge you a small amount for them. I, I'm here to tell you that as preachers, if you're going to use PowerPoint extensively, you need to budget some money. I know we did, that's, now I'm starting to really interfere with church work here. But we need to budget some money for visuals. I mean, there's going to be times when you need to buy an image, a stock image. And we'll talk about photography and that kind of stuff as we go through. But the difference makes a huge difference in the, in the cleanliness and in the professionalism of your presentation when you invest a small amount of money. There's a website called iStockphoto.com. It's the letter I, stockphoto.com. And you can buy images there that are, have enough resolution for PowerPoint for a dollar an image. It only costs you a buck. So out of a, a normal PowerPoint presentation, I usually don't ever spend more than about four or five bucks total on images. But I usually do want to buy four or five images, key images, where I need the image that I'm looking for. I, I need a specific thing to really make my point. And rather than to spend three hours looking through Google images and finding one that the resolution is not right or whatever, I can go to iStock Photo and I can search it and I can find an image that's really close to what I need and it'll cost me a dollar. Just to reinforce your point, I was looking for a particular slide and I was just looking for it on Google or, or for a particular image. iStock Photo came up all over. They were great, but they have the big iStock Photo on them unless you buy them. And so it took me another couple hours just to find something that would be, and it wasn't even as good. So and that's why if you spend the buck, iStock Photo gives you the one without the big iStock Photo logo <laughs> in the middle of it. I have actually seen PowerPoint presentations <laughs> where their main image was this, uh, you know, a woman and child with this giant iStock Photo label across the middle of it, but they didn't want to spend the buck. So they, they used the little free downloadable JPEG and stretched it out to make it take up the whole slide. And it looked foolish. I mean, it just is silly. If this is the way that you are going to present, I don't think it's a hard sell to, to convince elderships or men's business meetings that you need 150 or $200 a year budget for visual aids. I mean, that's really what it is. And, and we need to be thinking in those time frames. I mean, we need to be thinking in that those kinds of terms. Here's one that I actually put together uh, for a presentation that I did using technology to fulfill this vision. Uh, these are some stock images. And, and I have to say up front, I have an advantage. Well, my advantage is that I was a professional graphic designer for 12 years. So, you know, this stuff is in some ways comes more naturally to me. I have some training in putting together visuals. Uh, but you can find information and you can find imagery like this uh, out there. Because I used to sell imagery out there like this all the time. Yeah. Did you make this slide? Yeah, this is a slide that I made. That actually, the illustration in the background is an image that I put together from multiple iStock photo images and then I put the text on Do the you top. need a special program to build you, like you do, and we're going to talk about that. I use a product called Photoshop, uh, which is a professional level tool, but they make a, a product called Photoshop Elements. And Elements is, I think, I, I checked on the internet the other day, you can pick up a copy of Elements for about $69. I strongly recommend that you do that. Um, when you start to get into doing PowerPoint, and again, we're talking about using PowerPoint effectively. There are some little things that you need to be able to do with images to make them more usable. Now, you don't necessarily have to do this, where it's uh, this full-blown composite illustration, but there are times when you do need to soften the edges or you need, need to create a custom background. And we're going to talk about how to do all of that today. Um, and, and a program like Photoshop Elements lets you do it very easily. There are some free products on the Internet. One is called GIMP. G-I-M-P. Uh, Doug, have you ever heard of GIMP? Are you familiar with it? Uh, since you're my computer guy in the class, I thought maybe you had. Uh, it's an it's a editing program. It's a photo editing program that's free online. It's open source. It's a little harder to use because it is freeware. Um, so the learning curve on it is maybe a little bit heavier. 
Um, but there are there are products out there that will let you do that. Have you heard of Picasa? Picasa is actually a, um, a program that lets you keep track and organize your photos. You can do some basic editing. You can get rid of red eye. You can brighten it or you can darken it and that kind of stuff. But you really can't do the kinds of things I'm going to show you you need to be able to do with Picasa. Picasa is a great program to keep all your pictures and your graphics organized. And I do recommend that you use a program that does that. Now, Photoshop Elements has that component built in as well. It lets you keep track of all your images, but it also lets you edit them at a deeper level. You can do more things to them. Uh, and we'll get into those, what those kinds of things are in just a minute. Here's another title slide that I think just really <laughs> hits home. Truths we need to hear. Now, has anybody not seen PowerPoint presentations that start like this? I mean, this is pretty common stuff. Um, you, you, you get there, and the preacher stands up, and okay, I'm about to give you truths you need to hear. Boy, I'm ready. I'm really anxious. Compare it to something like this, bearing fruit for the kingdom. Simple photo of some grapes. That background is actually that same photo of grapes that's just been blurred. Um, and I, it gives you a very nice presentation. So it's something that, that looks a little cleaner, looks a little bit more professional. There's another decent one. Search and rescue. It's going to talk about Matthew 18 and Throughout the presentation, he kept using this graphic over and over again to reinforce his point. It's a great visual hook. Uh, and again, for a title slide, it's nothing fancy. It's, it's not like that illustration with the faces and everything. But it certainly is something better than why people leave the Lord. All right, well, I'm about to leave this auditorium. You know, it, we got we to gotta do our best. To, to get their attention and keep it. And I'm not one for entertainment. I'm not one to say that everything's got to be, you know, polished and uh, wonderful. But the more that you can do to get them interested in your message and to keep their focus, the better off you are. I mean, I, I think that's simply logical. I took this particular one and just found two photographs. I didn't do anything special. I just changed the typeface, uh, why people leave the Lord. Now, this first one's a little bit weird. Uh, you know, I've had some people say, who are these people and why are they walking on a path and that kind of stuff. But I, I think there's some suggestion here of people talking. It's an older man counseling a younger woman. Uh, maybe he's the preacher and she's struggling. And so why people leave the Lord, I think that works to some degree. It's not going to be on screen that long, so I don't think it's going to be that confusing. Here's another one of a person walking alone on a road. Uh, that's a dark road by himself, headed hopefully toward the light in the distance, but why people leave the Lord. Again, simple photos that, that help you do something more than just why people leave the Lord, right? I, I mean, do something to try to get their interest. Try to, try to lead them in. Why are you going to pull the book off the shelf when you go to the bookstore? Anybody else here, I, and I think I asked this the other day, like bookstores? I love bookstores. Why do you pull a book off a shelf? Because of its appearance. Because of its appearance. I, I mean, bottom line is, there's a lot of psychology into what color the spine of the book is. Why is that? Because they want you to grab that book off the shelf. It's competing visually with a thousand other books on the shelf, even if you're looking in a particular category, it's competing with all kinds of other folks. And so you gotta, you got to strive for getting their attention. And your title slide can do the same thing. Well, it seems like I have a repeat here of a slide, so we'll skip it through that real fast. In addition to title slides, you need a basic information slide and a, and a Bible quote slide. What I mean by that is this. Here's, here's an example of the title slide that we just looked at a minute ago. The title of the sermon was Bearing Fruit for the Kingdom. And the information slide was this. Basically, it's the same background. It's the same typeface. The title of the sermon runs along the top edge of the slide. And you've even got the graphic of the grapes in that upper right-hand corner. 
to keep reinforcing the fact that you're in the same presentation. These two things go together very well. And so now I've got this whole space in the middle. I've got all of this room that I can put bullet points or I can drop more pictures. I can do all kinds of things. But you still keep track of what the title of the sermon is, where you're going, what it's about. And if you remember the other day, and we'll see it again in a few minutes, you remember the other day that the example that I gave you of that one slide about baptism. We compare those two slides, the one that said the biblical texts and just had a bunch of verses and two Bible books, and the other one that said baptism and had a picture of a baptism, had the word baptism at the top. Do whatever you can to keep the information on the screen that allows them to have a placeholder, if you will. What is he talking about? If I am distracted for a moment and I come back and you've changed screens, am I completely lost? Do I have any idea what you're talking about or can I reconnect where you are uh, quickly? Now, I'm here to tell you that you cannot always just have the entire title of your sermon at the top of the slide. I realize that. But when you can, it's a good, it's a good little visual hook to keep them connected. Now, you know, the Levitical priesthood in the time of Moses, you know, I mean, you can't have an entire paragraph up there. So if I needed to, I could probably shorten this to bearing fruit, and it would still keep the same message. Or fruit for the kingdom, or something along those lines. So if I needed to shorten it, I could, uh, but still keep it before them. Here's that other title slide that I showed you using technology to fulfill his vision. And here was the actual information slide that I used. Just got that same graphic from the title slide in that upper left-hand corner this time. And it still gives me plenty of room. Now, I'm not big on white slides, but that particular one, there was a reason that I stayed with white, and it, it worked pretty well. Here's the one that I told you that I purchased. This was the... Uh, title slide, and this was the information slide. Now, I think this is starting to borderline on too large uh, an object in that upper left-hand corner. We're starting to invade the space that you need to communicate, and that's easy to do. So when you create basic title, sli title slides or basic information slides or even Bible text slides, you do have to start to be aware that as this graphic that you want to keep on the screen gets larger, you're minimizing how much room you have on the rest of the screen to actually tell your message. So while this one, I think, looks very professional and is very clean, especially color-wise, if you look at the monitor in the back, the colors on it are very nice, it, it's a little imposing. I mean, it, it starts to invade uh, the space that you really need, and so it might be a little heavy. Here's one that I created for a sermon that I did here at Bear Valley called Singing from the Heart. I took a picture of a song that we were going to sing in worship. The wonders of digital cameras, folks. It, again, you know, we talk about buying stock photography and that kind of stuff. Buy yourself a decent little digital camera and you can do a lot of really cool things. I don't know if you remember yesterday in my presentation when I was talking about newspapers and I had that picture of the newspaper, and then I talked about how many tons it was, and it just replicated itself and turned into a giant pile of newspapers. That was a newspaper that I shot on my driveway at home with a digital camera. All I did was drop it on the sidewalk, and I put my camera straight down and shot it, and then I took it into Photoshop and cut it out so that it didn't have a background, and just used that as my graphic. Um, it's real easy to do, and here I just took the songbook right out of the pew, took a picture of this particular song because I knew I had asked the song leader to lead this song while we were uh, while I was doing the lesson. And so it was a way to connect people with not only the message but music the information that they had just sung about from a song that they had just sung. And then my basic information slide was essentially this. Now, Common Thread was my, my title, but you'll notice that it's a little harder to see in here. You need to understand that the, the projector in this classroom in particular is a little dim. 
Uh, it's much brighter even in our auditorium than it is in this classroom. So again, if you kind of look to the back and you look at the monitor at the back, you'll see that across the top edge, in this kind of handwriting script font, I just kept repeating the words, singing from the heart. That was my title. So I wanted that reinforced. And then in large letters, kind of screened back, it says singing from the heart. But I could then drop information right over the top of that slide and you can see it's not distracting from my type. It's very easy to read, but it still keeps consistency throughout my presentation. I'm still showing them the same information. They're not going to get confused about what we're talking about. We're talking about singing from the heart, and that's really the message that I was trying to drive home. Does that make sense? So, putting it all together. Well, here's one that we talked about yesterday. This particular slide has a lot of good information on it. What's wrong with it? Miles, what's wrong with this slide? That's a good way to describe it. It's too much. It's too much of what? It's too much of everything. It's too much tight. The uh, color combination itself. The colors, yeah, the color combination is difficult. It's hard to read. Again, use my blur your eyes trick. Squint at this screen. What stands out? He was person cross. Okay, well, that's, that's important, but you don't get anything else off of this slide other than that. And so I wanted to create a way for this to be more effective. First thing I did was simply dim the background, make it a little darker. And you can see that really helps quite a bit. It's still too much. The colors are still out of control. There's still too much information on this slide. But notice the difference just, just by darkening it, how much more readable it is. I mean, that is difficult to read at best. That's at least readable. There's still too much information, but it's readable. So I actually used this particular template that I downloaded. All of the information that is on this slide or on these next slides. But I want to show you, rather than dumping all of this onto the screen and then talking for five minutes or six minutes or eight minutes to explain it all, I'm going to break it down into chunks so that we can deal with it each thing one at a time. Notice, his point was he was the person of the cross. Well, obviously he's talking about Jesus. The whole system of <coughs> salvation centers around the cross. And he quotes, or he actually doesn't quote, he, he lists. Galatians 6, 14, and Philippians 2, 8. And then he says, Isn't it strange that the only person who ever lived a sinless, spotless life died the most horrible death known to mankind? Those are his points. Now, let's, let's look at it this way. Here's my title slide. I've got you hooked visually. Uh, you're involved. You're engaged at this point. There's some interest here. And I can start by just saying... Jesus was the person of the cross. That was his main point, right? I can talk about that as long as I need to. Uh, I can control your interest. There's not a lot of extra stuff on the screen for you to be distracted by. I'm just simply making the point that Jesus was the person of, of the cross. And salvation is centered around that fact. Galatians 6, 14 and Philippians 2, 8 prove that. Now, here's where I have a, a personal opinion, this is gospel according to Mike, which you can take it or leave it. Just listing passages oftentimes doesn't do you a whole lot of good. Unless the audience knows what Galatians 6.14 says and knows what Philippians 2.8 says, listing it there really doesn't help them. And I'm here to tell you that most of the people in your congregation don't know what these verses say. You may want them to know. You may wish they knew, but they don't. So what I would do in this situation, I'm talking about salvation is centered around it. Galatians 6.14, look at Galatians 6.14. But may it never be that I would boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And I can make that point, and I can talk about what the Scripture says. I can remind them of what Galatians 6.14 is really all about. Philippians 2.8, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Put the words up there. Let them see 
what that listing of verses talks about. And then, isn't it sad that the only sinless, spotless die, life died the most horrible death known to mankind? You see, by changing this into five slides instead of one, I can keep your attention focused on just the individual point that I want to make right now. I want you to be thinking about Jesus being sinless and spotless. I don't want you drifting. I don't want you looking at the last point I made. I don't want you looking at the next point that's coming. Just think about that for a second. Jesus lived a sinless, spotless life. And yet he died the most horrible death known to mankind. Focus on this cross. Think about that. Don't be thinking about all the other things that are on this, this slide. I want you to focus on one thing and one thing only. Do you see how, you, how quickly you can help your audience drill in to the one point that you're trying to make? Typically, when you're speaking, you're not trying to make more than one point at a time. Are you? <laughs> if you are, homiletics class starts Monday. Typically, you want them to focus on a particular aspect of what you're talking about. Well, help them do that visually. But when you dump this much information on the screen, you're talking about the first point. Jesus was the person of the cross. I'm already reading he lived a sinless, spotless life, died the most horrible death known to man. You're not even there yet, but I am, because you've given me that option. You're telling me I can go anywhere on the screen I want to. And so guess what? I'm going to, because you're boring. I don't want to listen to you anyway. If I can read all the information that's on the slide, I'm looking for the clicker to move to the next slide. By the time I finish the last word on the slide, you're going to yammer on for another six or seven minutes, but I'm done. I'm ready to move on. And so we need to understand that. Here's another slide. We've looked at these. I just kind of want to go back over them a little bit and show you some information. We're going to look at this one a little bit more. Making a tremendously powerful, powerful point from Romans 5. The sacrifice that Jesus made, the, the, the justification that we achieved through his blood, and shows this powerful image of Jesus and the, the crown of thorns on his head, and he's bleeding and he's beaten, and I'm going to make my point in Romans 5. And you aren't going to get it. Because you can't see it. I mean... It's just not there. And so you're going to struggle to try to follow me. You're going to struggle to, find, to try to read it. But guess what? I'm putting so many roadblocks in your way. My point is going to be lost. You're going to be struggling visually, and you're not going to pay attention to what I happen to say. Now, exact same graphics. Okay? I went online and found the exact same photograph this guy used. I made my own custom background with it, but it's the same photograph of Jesus. Look at the difference between that and this. Look at the one in the back. It doesn't show up very well up here, does it? You almost can't see his face. Look at the one in the back. If you turned off the front lights, would it help? No, you know, we've tried that. These projectors, when we're running through the, the polycom system, these projectors dim uh, quite a bit, actually. And we're trying to get that resolved. But, um, but do you see the difference? You're still seeing the same face. I've still used red. I wouldn't probably use red in this, but that was the point of him using uh, the red lettering and everything was he wanted to stress that we are justified by his blood. But do you see now how much easier this is to stay with me? The text is readable. You can read it along with me. I can make my point. Plus the other thing, what from our class yesterday, what does this do that shouldn't be done? Covers, up his eyes. It covers his eyes. You want to make connection with that. And you look at the difference. And again, I apologize. I realize it's, it's hard to see up here. Uh, but I don't cover his eyes. So I can look at that face. While you're reading Romans 5, 1, and 9 to me, even though I know the text is there on the screen, I can be looking at that face. I can remember what he did. 
I can, I can make a personal connection to that because it's right there in front of me. I'm not covering it up. Now, what else about this slide uh, makes this work better? What about the way his face is, is positioned? What the work? Face the work. If, if this is a, an interesting little technique that you've got to be aware of. If I flip this photo around, it wouldn't work. And the reason is because, again, your eye is going to go to his eyes first. Where is it going to go next? Well, because of the way he's looking, you're going to follow and look toward the direction that the people in your slides, in your images, are looking. It's an old photographic technique, but bottom line is I'm interested in what you're looking at. So when I look at a picture of a person, I look at their eyes, I see where their eyes are looking, and then I look where they're looking. So here's what's happening. We immediately go to his face. Our eyes go to his eyes, and then our eyes move to the left. Well, what's to the left? The text that I want you to see. So your eye keeps making this loop from the text to the crown to the eyes back to the text. And you'll stay in the middle of, your eyes will stay in the middle of this slide. They don't go off the page. Now, if I flip this around to his head, so his head was pointing to the right, my eyes would go from the crown to his eyes off the edge of the slide. And back to the crown, maybe to the text, back to the crown, to his eyes off the edge of the slide. Because I'm looking where he's looking. So try to have your people, the, the direction of things, move toward the center of the slide, and your slides will feel uh, a bit more balanced. Does it make sense? Do you see the difference between just doing something as simple as that versus this? Not a lot of super duper difficult graphic work here. It's just a matter of thinking it through. I mean, we're going to deal with this one more in depth uh, as we go through. I'm going to show you actually how I did this. We're, we're going to actually recreate a couple of these so that you can see how it's done. Uh, but it's really pretty, pretty straightforward. We'll also talk about resolution in that kind of thing. So what do you need? Well, obviously, you need a copy of PowerPoint if you're going to use PowerPoint. Duh. There's a red thing <laughs> You also need some image editing program. Now, as I mentioned, I use a program called Photoshop. Uh, but Photoshop Elements is very good. There's another one called Photo Impact by a company called ULead uh, that used to be real inexpensive. It was about $39. I think the, the learning curve on it's a little heavy just because it, it's not as logical in some areas, but it's cheap, so that's good. But you need some way to edit the images that you're going to use. Too often, one of the biggest problems with poor PowerPoint is that people are just using images the way they find them randomly through the internet and slapping them up there. And again, to do this right, you need to take a little extra time. You need to learn some new skills. Now, I also understand that a preacher's job is demanding and that you don't have time to take graphic de design classes while you're a full-time preacher. I, I, I do get that. Um, but there are some things you can learn very quickly, very easily, that really don't take a whole lot of your time. But they'll make a tremendous difference in how your visuals are Thirdly, you need some image sources. Those of you that use PowerPoint, what's your number one source for images? I heard somebody say Google. Ray, what do you, I mean, you use PowerPoint a lot, don't you? What's an image? Just any kind of graphic for the? I don't use many, but I did various things. Some we do ourselves up with the digital cameras, and some I just uh, you know get, go, go to Google. Or Rick, what do you? I was the Google guy. You were the Google guy. Uh, be careful with Google. Um, there's an interesting issue with Google. Um, first, if you use Google Images, make sure that you have safe searching turned on. <laughs> I really hate to say that. Um, 
but it's true. There is a preference within your Google setup that you can turn on what's called safe searching. And what it does is it filters out garbage, pornography, that you can find very quickly online. Uh, an example that I gave when I did a uh, pornography seminar for kids was I, my kid needed a picture of a rose, a flower, for a science project. Wanted a picture of a red rose to put on the front of her cover. So I immediately jump on Google and search Google images for rose. Pretty innocent search, I thought. I wasn't even thinking about anything bad. I found like three million images. At the bottom of page one was a woman named Rose in all of her glory standing there on the hood of a car. Hello, I'm Rose. Well, I wasn't expecting that. Um, now, that can come as quite a shock to you when you're looking for a picture of a rose and you end up with rose. Um, so I went in. I had forgotten about safe, safe searching. I went in and turned safe searching on. My search went from 3 million images down to 1.8 million images. It filtered out almost a half, a million and a half images that were inappropriate. Searching for the word rose. I did the same thing, you know, when I was doing this seminar, I searched for the word cars. My my son, my son in vain. I've never bought my son a coloring book. We're a technology family. He, he knows how to get on the internet and type in the word he's looking for with coloring pages added to it. And he finds coloring book pages all over the internet. A Star Wars coloring pages. And he'll find page after page. And he prints them out on the laser printer and he colors them. I don't, we don't need to go to Walmart and get him a coloring book. He can find coloring pages for anything he wants. So when I did this thing with Rose, it kind of alarmed me. So he's into the movie Cars. Anybody seen the movie Cars? Lightning McQueen? He did a Google image. I, he didn't do it. I did it because I was testing. He did a Google image search just for the word Cars on the very first page. Four naked women on the hood of Cars. Now I also found Lightning McQueen and all that other stuff, but with Safe Search turned off, I get all the garbage as well. Now when you turn Safe Searching on, it filters out. 98% of that garbage. So be real careful with Google Images. Uh, make sure that you turn that on. Protect your eyes. You know, we always sing the song to little kids, be careful little eyes what you see. Well, guess what? Be careful big eyes what you see, too. Once you get that kind of stuff in your head, it's hard to get it out. So the other thing with Google Images that I, I really want to caution you about is a thing called copyrights. <laughs> what are copyrights? No <laughs> Take a wild guess. The rights of the material. I'm a photographer. I mean, that's what I do it for fun. But I sell images online. I mean, I, I put my images on the internet for graphic designers to buy for brochures and that kind of stuff. Once I put them on the internet, anybody that downloads them can use them for anything they want. No. Huh? If they pay for them. If they pay, no, but it, I, I mean, hey, if I can download it, I can use it. The, all of the, that preacher that I saw that actually used the image that says I stock photo across the front of it, what does that symbol, I stock photo, mean? It <laughs> means they stole it. It means that image belongs to I stock photo, and until you buy it, you're not allowed to use it. They own the copyright on it. The artist owns the copyright on it. Now, I realize that nobody is trying to sell their sermons to make tons of money. But we do have to recognize, and, and what does Romans 13 1 tell us? We need to obey the laws of the land. As preachers, are we going to have a sermon on thou shalt not steal? And in the middle of it is a picture of a car thief that says, I stock photo across the front of it? <laughs> <laughs> Does that make sense? See, we got to think of those kinds of things. We, you know, it, it, copyrights can be a problem. And Google Images 
guess what? They don't care about copyrights. That's not what Google Images is there for. Google Images is just there to help you find pictures anywhere <coughs> they happen to be on the Internet. Now, they have been an interesting thing. On most pages, it says you need to be aware of copyrights, and you may not have the right to use this image. I'm just showing you where it is. What you do with it is up to you, but you may not have the right to use it. Now, everybody that has downloaded an image from Google Images, of course, has contacted the people who have built the website where they took the image off of and gotten permission, typically in writing, to use that image in their sermon on Sunday morning, right? I mean, we all do that, right? <laughs> Just be aware of it. Now, again, a lot of images on the Internet, the people don't care if you use them or not. But some of them they do. And so you, you need to be careful when you use those kinds of tools. And that's why I recommend uh, things like iStock Photo. When you pay your dollar for that image, guess what? You can use it for anything you want to. You have bought the rights to use that image. So, no problem. You can, uh, the neat thing about iStock Photo is that you can pay more money for higher resolution images. And we're going to talk about resolution here in just a minute. But if you wanted to put a picture of a family on the brochure for your congregation, you need a higher resolution image than you do if you're using it for PowerPoint or on your website. And so for 2 or $3, you can get a bigger picture, in essence, size-wise, so that you can print it out at a higher resolution. And again, it, it's real affordable. At, you know, $1 to 3 or $4 per image, there's really no reason why we need to be stealing images uh, in order to do stuff. A digital camera is another one that's, that's real important. I mean... Get yourself an inexpensive, it doesn't have to be a huge 35 millimeter digital SLR. Uh, they make some great cameras uh, that are very affordable these days. A lot of your cell phones have cameras. Now, my only word of warning when, it, when you talk about a digital camera is if the quality of the image is poor, what's the impression your audience has of your presentation? I mean, if you take a picture with your di digital camera and it's all crooked and out of focus, is that really helping you get your message across? No. So uh, look for various sources. In addition to iStock Photo, there are a lot of other places. They are called micro stock agencies. Just think of my miniature. <laughs> but micro stock is basically inexpensive stock photography. Uh, there are a number of websites you can just do a search for micro stock. There's one called Big Stock Photo. There's one called uh, Photolia. There's one called um, There's one called Digital Photography. Um, there's iStock Photo. There's a lot of them. Right? And you can look at them. Now some of them have different setups. For example, iStock Photo you buy credits. You, you pay like $30 and they give you 35 credits. And then you can down, each image costs you one credit or three credits. Basically a dollar to three, four dollars. Um, others you have to pay a monthly fee, but you can download as many images as you want during the month. You pay $60 a month, but you can download, you know, 100 images a month if you want to. So there's a lot of different ways that it's set up, uh, but it works out pretty well. Questions about the tools that you need and how to get them and that kind of stuff. Has anybody play in here played with Photoshop Elements or a program like that? Okay. Um, it, it really is very cool. Photoshop Elements is a great tool. It's very powerful for the price. And compared to regular Photoshop, which is, I think, full price for regular Photoshop is five or $600, um, it's, it's a no-brainer to go with something with Photoshop Elements. Okay, how-to books are the other thing that I, I that I strongly recommend. Now, again, I understand that you guys don't have a whole lot of time to read. I would much rather you be reading things to improve the quality of your lessons uh, and your knowledge of the Bible. But if you're going to jump into PowerPoint, you're going to have to learn some new skills. Uh, and 
getting a couple of how-to books on how to do uh, PowerPoint and that kind of stuff might be helpful. A word of warning. PowerPoint wasn't designed for preachers. It was designed for engineers and business professionals. So when you go out and buy a book or find a website on how to use PowerPoint, guess what they're going to tell you? Here's how to make a cool pie chart showing the percentage of sales in this region is this much and that kind of stuff. Well, last <coughs> time I looked, there aren't many sermons that are involved in pie charts and bar charts, okay? There might be a few, uh, but there aren't too many. So I understand that some of those kinds of how-tos really don't help you from a storytelling aspect uh, with PowerPoint. All right, let's look at some t tips and tricks. Let's have a little bit of fun. Uh, I'm going to flip back and forth. When I What I'm going to do, I'm going to do in Photoshop. Again, you can use Photoshop Elements. You can use GIMP. You can use a lot of other things. Uh, but I want you to note, look for a moment at the, the picture that's on the screen. You'll notice that this is a picture that I actually took here at Grand Valley. <laughs> this is a picture of our auditorium. And what I want you to notice is how soft the edges are. They ha they're actually transparent. Uh, and again, you might want to glimpse at the one in the back of the room if it's closer for you, but you see it a little bit better. Um, I actually, on the PowerPoint screen behind the speaker, have the title slide uh, that I showed you earlier just to show that there's a screen there. Uh, but the softness of the edge is really one of the things that we're going to talk about. How to do that. How to create transparency in images and break up things a little bit more. The other thing I want to talk about is image size and resolution. This is probably the biggest confusion that people have in dealing with PowerPoint. Here we have a picture of a lion. This is actually a, an image that I shot, but we download it from the website, and when we bring it into PowerPoint, this is how big it is, okay? It's no bigger than this. And this happens all the time. I see this every time I see PowerPoint, at least once. And we realize that we need it bigger than that. So we start scaling it up to the point where we make it really big. Now, it might be a little tougher to see in here, but if you look at the largest one, it starts getting really soft. It starts to look out of focus and blurry. It's not, it's not crisp. And the reason is because we started with an image that was very small. And when we make it bigger, we're telling the computer, okay, you have pixels in this image. Photographs are made up of pixels. When I make it bigger, when I make it wider, you need to add more pixels. So you need to guess what colors to make those pixels to make it bigger. And as the computer guesses, it slowly makes it softer and softer, and it, and it becomes what we call pixelated. Uh, we'll look at some examples of that that make that a little bit clearer. But whenever you see a picture that's really large, the edges of it look get what I call the jaggies. They look like little stair steps. That's all because they started with an image that just didn't have enough resolution to get it to the size they needed it. Now, what do I mean by all this resolution garbage? We need to talk about a little bit of science here for just a second. I promise we're not going to talk about it a lot, uh, but you need, do need to be aware. Most projectors to, today project a rectangle that is a particular size. Now, that may come as a surprise to you when you figure that the further I move away from the screen, the image gets bigger, right? But it's still the same size image. It's 1,024 pixels across by 768 pixels tall. So your space is 1,024 by 768. So if you want a full screen image, if you want to look for a, for a picture that's going to take up the entire slide, and if you don't want to distort it, you need an image that is 1,024 pixels by 768 pixels. Now there's a second part of resolution that confuses even more people. And it's called dots per inch or pixels per inch. For on-screen use on the web or in PowerPoint, 
you need an image that is 72 dots per inch or 72 pixels per inch. It'll be listed as DPI or PPI. Now, if you download an image uh, from Google Images, they're all 72 dots per inch. I mean, whenever you put something on the web, you put it up at 72 dots per inch. Now, what does that mean, and, and why do I care? We're going to look at some images taken from some digital cameras that start out at 72 dots per inch, but they're like 5,000 pixels wide by 4,000 pixels tall. Now, I could dump that into a PowerPoint and scale it down, and it would work just fine. But why would I not want to do that? Anybody got an idea? You start scaling it down, you have to take pixels out. Okay, so, so you, anytime you change the size of an image, be it scaling it up or scaling it down, the image degrades. So scaling it down is a problem, but it doesn't really take pixels out of it. There's the, there's the kicker. It just shrinks them. Pixels don't really have a particular size, so it just compresses them all. So scaling images down is better than scaling images up. Typically, when you shrink an image, it doesn't get a whole lot softer. When you make one bigger, it gets a lot softer. So from that standpoint, shrinking it down is not a huge problem. What's the problem? I only need 1,024 by 768. If I drop an image in here that's 5,000 pixels by 3,000 pixels, the image might be a megabyte or two or four or five. I, I actually, this happens all the time, I, since I'm slamming everybody in this class. Poor Bill Stewart. <laughs> One day, he, he had come back from a trip, I think it was an Africa trip, and he said, you know, ever since I got back from Africa, my computer has just been so slow. I can't figure out what's wrong with it. It won't do anything. It takes forever to check email. It's just going crazy. I said, well, is the whole machine slow or just email? He said, no, mostly just email. But when I launch my mail program, it just takes forever to do anything. I said, what was the last thing you emailed? He said, well, I sent a PowerPoint that I had done from my Africa trip to a bunch of my supporters. I said, well, how big was the PowerPoint file? He said, I don't know. There's probably 100 pictures in it. I said, no, how big in megabytes was the PowerPoint file? I don't know. I didn't. I don't even look at that kind of stuff. He had taken full resolution images from his digital camera, five megapixels each, which means each one is about three megabytes, and dropped it into a slide times a hundred slides. When I finally shut everything off on his computer and checked the size of the PowerPoint file, he's emailing to like 70 people. It's a 350 megabyte PowerPoint file. It's just choking his computer to death because it's huge. Now, instead of 5,000 pixels across by 3,000 pixels high, he only needed 1,000 pixels by 768. An image that size is a couple hundred K rather than a few megabytes. So image resolution affects the size of your PowerPoint file dramatically. It also affects your computer's ability to change and, and display those those files. If you drop a 10 megabit, megabyte file on one slide and it only needs a few hundred K size image, you're asking your computer to process 10 megabytes every time you hit that slide. And of course, you've used these nice fancy transitions where it fades in from the previous image to the new one. <laughs> all of that's computing power, all of that's memory that gets sucked down the drain because you've got an image on your slide that is far bigger than it needs to be in resolution. Not in size, not in shape, because I can make these any size I want. Shape-wise, I can change them. But the amount of information that is contained in that image is still going to be five megabytes, no matter how large I scale it on screen or shrink it on screen. So it's another reason why you need a program like Photoshop Elements or Photoshop or GIMP, so that you can actually change the resolution of these images to be what you need them to be, 1024 by 768.
We're actually going to do that, so I'll, I'll show you what I mean, and once we do it, it'll make more sense. But I want to show you an example of, of pixelization. And it's probably going to be a little hard to see in here, but the image, there's actually two images on the screen. One is really tiny. This was the original image that I downloaded from the internet. And I scaled it up to fit onto this whole slide. One of the things I want you to notice is right along her cheek, you see it most pronouncedly. You see these little stair steps. You see it's called the jaggies. And it's because there's just not enough resolution in this image. You can see some strange things going on in her forehead. Some pixelization going on in her forehead. You can see some jaggies down her arm. You can see some weirdness going on in her fingers and in her hands. It just doesn't look right. Well, this is what happens when people take images and say, well, it doesn't really matter what size it is. I need it full screen, so even though it's this little tiny image when I bring it into PowerPoint, I'm just going to grab the corners of it, and I'm going to stretch it out until it fills the whole screen. It happens all the time. Here's another example with this with the lion. That lion just doesn't look right. But when I go to the, because the original was only this size. But when I go to the next one, look at the back. It's a little easier to see in the back the difference between the two. Look at the big lion. And then when I switch screws, slides, Look at how much sharper that is. I mean, you can even see the detail on his teeth. You can see the detail in his whiskers a lot better. Now, again, it doesn't show up as well on our projectors down here because we're going through this system. But even on the projectors in the auditorium, it makes a noticeable difference. So start with quality images. Scale them to the right sizes, and don't mess with them in PowerPoint. You have some latitude. You can probably increase the size of an image maybe 10%, and it's not going to hurt it much. But once you get much beyond 25-30% in scaling it, the image is going to start to break down. And so uh, look for signs that the image is, is not uh, going to hold up. Buy a higher resolution image. Download a higher resolution image. Do something to keep your images crisp and sharp. We all remember this slide. We've looked at it a number of times. Um, you can see it even on, our, on these projectors. Look at the spikes of the crown. Do you see the, the, almost the halo around them? See how right along the edge it's, it's almost whiter? It looks like they're outlined somehow. That's all signs of pixelization. You see it along his shoulders. You see it along the edge of his face. See how it almost looks like somebody took a white crayon and outlined it. That's because this image started out too small. But the person wanted a full-size image. Now, I don't think he needed the image full size, is the point, but when he was laying it out, he wanted to go for drama, so scale it up. This is actually the size of the image. Now, notice what else has been done. What else has changed? He's been squished. Anybody, there used to be a comedy show on a long time ago where people would squish your head. Have you ever seen it? <laughs> um, kids in the Hall was a Canadian comedy troupe, but they used to do this thing where they used to play this little game where they put the TV camera so you could see their fingers and they try to squish your head. Well, this is what happens. You squish people's heads and it, it, it distorts people. His head is not that shape. Nobody's head is that shape. <laughs> That's the shape of his head. And here's the problem is this is really the size of the image. And so by the time, and, and again, here it's maybe a little bit more difficult to see, but this image is nice and crisp and sharp. There's no little halo around the, the thorns. They're very crisp. His face has got good detail. His clothing has nice detail. I, I mean, it's a good image. So 
even once I make you aware of resolution, you now know not to scale this image up that big. Well, this is the solution a lot of guys will do. They'll take a white slide, and they'll just shove it into the, the lower right-hand corner, and then they'll drop their text on it. Now, i got to say, this is an improvement over what the other guy did. Would you agree? You, you have the strength of the image. You have readable type. At, at least you have made an improvement from what the first guy did, right? You get that? But we still have a problem. And the problem here becomes these walls. You've got these barriers here, these lines, these crisp lines that actually chop the slide up into some funny shapes, don't they? I mean, we, we kind of have this weird upside down L shape for the slide and then just this image shoved in the corner. So anything we do in here, we've got to deal with this space and, and our eye keeps bumping up against those hard edges. So why not do something like this? Do you see how much more your eye moves freely through this than it does that? Now these are subtle things and I realize it takes some training to get used to it, but there's a pretty big difference between that and this. First of all, what have I eliminated? You don't see the upside down L anymore, do you? It's still kind of there, but you don't notice it because there's, there's no hard edges. And now when I drop text in, it seems like it flows a little bit more freely. When I go back here and put text in, I've got this weird L. I've got this big empty spot up here that looks like a rectangle, doesn't it? it looks, I mean, we see it as a rectangle because of this straight line. And even this word now, when it crosses this line, almost looks like we blew it. We, it. That needs to be another line down or something. There's something weird here that our eye doesn't feel comfortable with because we we call that violating the line. Whenever you cross over a hard boundary like that, it seems like it just isn't right. You shouldn't have done that. But as soon as you start to soften up graphics, There's no, red, there's no rectangle up here anymore. There's some white space, but it doesn't seem to bother us, does it? It's not this rectangular shape that it was before. There's no line here to violate, so I was actually able to make this, the text a little bit bigger, uh, make it a little easier to read. And you've got just a nice, soft transition, but you still have the graphic that you wanted to present. The power of this image is still here. We just softened it so that it feels like it's part of a whole rather than just something that you slapped into the corner. Did you have a question? I was going to say that that's more dramatic. It's much it's more dramatic. Talk, it would be. It's a, it's a great way to say that. It creates drama. This looks like an afterthought. It looks like you just grabbed a picture and went, because guess what? That's what you did. <laughs> now, I, I'm not saying that that's wrong, and that's the way most people are going to deal with images. But as soon as you start to look at the image as a whole, this whole rectangle is one image that I want to present. Your whole view changes, and you're able to soften things up and lead the eye through an image in a much better way. So... I haven't had to, what else have I not had to do? I haven't had to distort this image. I didn't squish it. Remember the guy we saw yesterday that was squished, so he looked like he was a stick person in the poor bride and groom that looked like they were stick people as well because they squished. So I haven't done any squishing. I haven't done any stretching. I haven't, I, I wanted to create drama. That's the reason the guy made the image full size, full screen, right? That's what he was after. I want, to, I want impact. This actually has more impact, and I didn't have to mess with the image. Now, all I had to do was create a soft edge, and I'm going to, again, I'm going to show you how to do that. 
But look at your slide as a whole image, as one complete image. Before you start to bring things in and off of the screen, I always look at my finished slides first. What do I mean by that? When my slide is done with my image and my text, I look at it this way. Then I decide, do I want to bring the text in some transition? Do I want to fly something in? Do I want to dissolve something in? But I always want to see it as a complete finished slide first. And then play with how things come in and out and on and off of the slide. Does that make sense? I almost do my entire presentation with completed slides. One right after another. I don't worry about transitions. I don't worry about entries and exits. I just want to see each individual slide totally complete. And then I go back, and to me, the polish is, okay, how do I want to bring this slide on the screen? How do I want it to exit the screen? And I can do all of that afterwards. But it's after I've made sure that my images are balanced and that I've presented things well. Now, take this to the next level. Instead of just throwing him in the lower right-hand corner, if I really want to go after drama, if I really want to do something that I think is even more powerful, okay, now take it to this next level. Again, it's hard to see there, but look at the back screen. I haven't changed this graphic at all size-wise. I scaled it up a little bit, uh, but I can do that now because of the way I'm treating it, and I don't get the jaggies and that kind of stuff, and I can bring my type on the screen, and I've got a really powerful image that still uses the red that I wanted for the drama of the blood, but in a much more powerful way than just taking a giant photo and slapping a bunch of giant bold red type across the front of it. Now, what did all of that take? More time. You got to think it through a little bit. You got to look at things. You can't just grab images and slap them together. Now, I will say that this is better than, than that one was. I, didn't, I don't have the text on this image. But this is an improvement, right? I think everybody agrees. This is even more of an improvement. And in my mind, this is even a bigger improvement. So there are steps that you can take. You don't have to go from, you know, bad to great. I mean, there are little things that you can do to make it better. You just need to be aware of those things and you need to work toward those things. Okay? So, how did I do this? I mean, what did I do with these images in order to get uh, softer edges and that kind of stuff? Well, on a white background, it's actually very simple. I'm going to actually um, go over here for a second. I'm going to launch Photoshop. When you're dealing with a white background, editing graphics becomes really simple because all you have to do to create a soft edge is paint on it with white. As long as your background is white, I don't have to do anything fancy. For example, I'm going to go ahead and open this, this file of, of um, the head of Jesus. There's the picture, okay? I'm going to make it a little larger so that you can see it. But there's the image. Now, the edges are hard because of the edge of the photo. If I know that I'm going to lay this on white, all I have to do is simply grab a paintbrush that uses white ink. And I, again, I'm not going to show you how to do that in Photoshop because it would be different in different uh, programs. But you can see this big circle. That's my paintbrush. And now all I have to do is paint with the white paint. And you'll see that the brush has a nice soft edge to it. That's the way the brushes are. You can make them hard edged or soft edged. But I'm just going to paint some white around him. Now this lower right-hand corner, 
I don't really need to mess with because I'm going to put him in the lower right-hand corner of my slide. So I don't have to paint over that. I, I, the hard edges there are going to be hidden by the edge of the slide, right? So now all I have to do is save this file. I'm going to just save it on my desktop here. And I'm going to call this white. And now when I go back to PowerPoint, I'm going to quit my presentation so that I can look at the actual slide. And duplicate the slide. Just a second. Get rid of the text. And I'm going to get rid of that original graphic. And now all I have to do is insert the picture. So insert picture, find the one that I just edited on my desktop, insert it, and if I butt it up into that corner. Now I can probably stand to scale this 10%, it won't hurt me too bad. So I'm going to bring it up a little bit. And there, it's nice soft edge along that bottom. Now, the only time this becomes a real problem is if I don't use a, a white background. If I change this background to something else, uh, let's say for right now I'm going to change it to red. Why has it got sharp edges? Because it's a rectangular image. I mean, at this point I painted it white. Now, if I knew that I was going to use it on this color red background, I could find out what this red color is. I could go in and paint the image red, and I could accomplish the same thing. But guess what? If I want to then use the image on blue, got the same issue, right? I'm going to show you how to actually create transparent images using ping files uh, to solve this problem. Uh, and we'll do that after the break, where the bell is about to ring for break. But the solution to this is going to be to change the type of file. But you can see just real quick, I'm going to take this back to white. That works. How long did that take me? You see, we're not talking about tons of time here. It doesn't take hours and hours to manipulate these images to get them to work. But simply downloading the image from the internet, taking it into an image editing program, painting the edges that I know I want soft to the color of my background, and placing it, and I've got a much more powerful image just that fast. And I'm eliminating those strong rectangular lines that, that just look blocky and unprofessional. Pretty simple trick, right? Uh, so we will stop there for right now and uh, pick this up after break. Okay, we're back from break. One of the things that I was asked during the break that I think is valuable for everybody is, uh, one of the brothers wanted to know, okay, you said how-to books. What are some good how-to books? Uh, the truth is that software changes so quickly that, that how-to books on PowerPoint, sometimes it's hard to stay current. You know, they just released 2008 PowerPoint. Well, right now, if you go to the bookstore, you probably won't find a book on 2008 because they just launched it. So um, the one that I recommend more than anything else, and again, this is because I'm a visual learner, uh, is a website called lynda.com. It's L-Y-N-D-A dot com. And I, I'll actually um, show you here. Lynda.com actually has video training uh, for a number of different products. You can learn Microsoft Word, you can learn Excel, you can learn Office, but they have a title on PowerPoint, and actually it's five different titles that they have available. One is how to make effective presentations, one is how to use um, Office for Mac 2008, new features. Graphic Secrets for Business Professionals is a four-hour course that's really 
kind of nifty. And then PowerPoint 2007 and even PowerPoint 2003. The cool thing about lynda.com is they started out with PowerPoint 2003 training. Well, when 7 came out, they gave new training, but they left the old one on there. So if you're using an older version, you can still go back, typically, and find the version that you're using and get some training on it. But what you're doing is you're actually looking at somebody's computer screen as they do things. And they're talking. And uh, if you've watched any of the videos on the Logos website, the screencasts, it's the same kind of deal. Uh, you're looking at their computer monitor. They're going through how to do things in PowerPoint. And you can follow along. So uh, it's $25 a month or $250 a year. Uh, to have access to everything that's on their website. And there's literally hundreds of things that you can learn. Both they have uh, a class on Photoshop Elements that I've, I've talked to you about. You have classes on Photoshop, Outlook, uh, Microsoft Office, all kinds of things that you would probably find useful. Windows Vista, Windows XP. Uh, they do have a Word Perfect class. I didn't realize that, but they have a Word Perfect title. Uh, so you can learn about WordPerfect. So I really, I, I've been using lynda.com now for probably three or four years, and I just, I, I just pony up for a year subscription. To be honest with you, it's two hundred and fifty dollars, but I watch probably seventy, eighty videos a year at least, uh, and I certainly get my money's worth out of them. So. Uh, you might want to consider doing that. So that's one that I recommend. It's not a book, but it, it will work. Can you pay per per video? Or no, you, you pay per month, which you could do is, is it's just month to month. They're just going to charge a credit card. So what I, I've recommended this site to a few people who have said, okay, I want to just learn the PowerPoint. I'm going to pay my $25 for the month. I'm going to make sure that this month I get through all of those classes, and at the end of the month I'm going to call them and say, cancel me, don't charge me anymore, and they'll stop. So uh, in essence, you could take all six, five of these PowerPoint classes, uh, which is, I don't know, looks like 14, 18, 20 hours of PowerPoint training. Is it a video where you can kind of follow along with the PowerPoint? Yes. Um, like with your own and do it yourself. Yes. Side. I mean, you're looking at their screen. So they're going to say, go to this menu, click on this, and see what happens. And you can pause it and then do it yourself on your, you know, with your PowerPoint and follow along. Okay. Uh, they have uh, files that you can download, so you're actually using the same files that they are. The cost to have access to the training files is a little bit more than without the training files, but you can check out lynda.com and find that information. On this lynda.com, do you have like a password that you log on, or do you have to use a specific computer that you signed up? No, nope, you have a password that you log on, so you can gain access to it from any computer. So you can look at it on your desktop while doing something else on your laptop. Exactly. Yep. And the nice thing is, is that if you're at home, you can access your account. If you're at the office, you can access your account. <coughs> if you're in London, you can access your account. So it's it's pretty neat. Okay. We were, we were just talking about simply making uh, these, these images softer so that when you do present them, now you've got this nice soft edge. Uh, Brother Rick was reminding me that in the new version of the PowerPoint, 2007 on Windows, 2008 uh, on the Mac, you can now create transparency on the fly, but it's rectangular. What I mean by that is it softens the edges. Your picture has a rectangular edge. It'll soften that so you don't have that really hard line. But you can't do what we just did where you actually can paint and create this curve around his head. It's, it's still going to be a, a rectangular shape. You follow that? It's just going to soften those edges. Now, that being said, softening those edges makes a big difference, even if it is rectangular. <coughs> Anytime you can avoid hard edges, unless you want them intentionally, you're going to, to give the person's eye the chance to move through your entire slide much easier. It, it's it's going to be much better uh, doing it that way than um, having rectangular shapes. Okay? Let's... Um, Let me get 
back to where we were here. See if you can follow along with my presentation. <laughs> Okay, this is basically where we were. I want to talk about creating transparency in edges. Uh, notice this image that's on the screen. You have these two guys that are sitting there. I intentionally used a gridded background of these slides so that you could see where images are transparent and where they're not. But notice these two men, and I know for people at home that are watching online, I keep walking away from the camera, but um, notice how the grid actually shows up between these guys and around the edge. And this this image of some metal type that's on the ground, it's, it fades in and out around the edges. And even it even crosses over, so the type is transparent over this guy's leg. These are actually two different images, and I can move them around. I'm going to go ahead and stop the presentation and just show you PowerPoint. But I can actually grab these images and move them around, and you can see how they're transparent. They overlap one another. So this is kind of the next level. Rather than just painting the edges of a rectangle the color of the background, I actually want to figure out ways to actually make it transparent. The advantage of that is then I can put it on any background I want, and it works. Okay? So we're going to look at that. Traditionally, creating this kind of transparency has been done with, with GIF files, GIF files on the web. Well, there's a problem. And the problem is exactly <coughs> what we're looking at here. You remember our friend who's <laughs> jumping for joy because I guess he just got out of prison is the best way I can interpret this slide. But he's... He's a transparent file. He's a transparent GIF file. And what's happening is you'll notice there, there is no background <coughs> around him. But what do you pick up? You pick up this little jaggy line all the way around him. And that's because he was most likely on a white background or something close to white. And when they saved him as an animated GIF file, if they dropped him onto a white background, it looks pretty good. But now, on a colored background, you see the little jaggies all the way around him. And it, it looks distracting. It, it just, it looks unprofessional. Now, again, if you put him on a white background, he's going to look just fine. But when you start to put him on color, it looks like a three-year-old cut him out with those little scissors with the rounded tips that just kind of, because they can't make the same cut in the same place twice. Here's another example. It's about commitment. It's not conviction this time. It's about commitment. Now, this was the title slide of somebody's presentation. Why show a picture of a guy on his knees what is what image? Do, I mean, this doesn't relate to commitment. To me. He's a Muslim. But this is an example of the problem with animate with transparent GIF files. You have this bizarre little halo around him at the bottom because he's got this soft gradient shadow around him, and the back of his the photo was blown out to white. So when they chose the background color as white to get rid of, it looked like it is on fire. Or Somebody chopped out half of his back. Um, that's what happens. Now, if I put him on a white background, he's probably going to look okay. But as soon as I start dealing with color, it's a huge problem. Compare that to this. Look at where it says tips and tricks. You can see the lettering float behind these guys. I mean, it's, it's a transparent file. And no matter where I move it, it shows up as transparent. The advantage of that, obviously, is what we talked about earlier. I can change backgrounds, and the image works. I don't get the little jaggies around them. I just get transparency at different levels. See that? Yeah. 
that term capacity is available for the 2008 Microsoft Office? No, this doesn't have to do with PowerPoint. This has to do with the kind of graphics file it is. When you hear, and we kind of have to go back to the pixel and resolution conversation for a minute, or at least a similar conversation. What file format do you use in PowerPoint? If you have an image, what are the best file formats to use with PowerPoint? JPEG. JPEG is number one, okay? Most of the larger images that you get online are going to be JPEGs, full color images. JPEG is a compressed file format, which means they've taken a larger image and through some digital manipulation in the background, they have squeezed that file down into a smaller size without losing a lot of the quality of the image. So JPEG is awesome for online stuff and for on-screen stuff because you get full range of color, but in a smaller file format. These transparent images are actually PNG files, P-N-G files. And P-N-G, PNG files, have this ability to save things with a transparent background. But they have a range of full grayscale levels of background. So that's how you can get this soft transparency and not just pick one color. The problem with GIF files is when you pick a color to make it transparent, you can only pick one color. So you pick white. Well, every pixel in that image that's white will be transparent. But an image that is just slightly gray won't be. An image that is medium gray won't be because it's not white. It'll only select the pixels that are white and make them transparent. With PNG, you can have it say everything from pure white to 70% gray, I want transparent. And it'll do the whole range. So you get these very soft, sweeping levels of transparency, which makes these look so natural. So let's actually do one just for the fun of it. I'm going to go to PowerPoint. We'll use our same file here. I'm in Photoshop. But what I want to do is I'm going to actually, instead of painting with white now, I'm actually going to create a mask. And this is something that these programs allow you to do. And now instead of painting with black, or with white, I'm painting with black in the mask. And you'll see this. Can you see the little checkerboard? Yes. Anything that's checkerboard will end up transparent. Basically what I'm doing is I'm removing any color information from this part of the file. So as soon as I do that, I can now go and I can save this. And I save it for the web because PNG is a web file format. And I'm going to save it as PNG24. What that means is it's a 24-bit PNG image. You don't really need to understand all the technical aspects of that. But when I save it as PNG24, I have this choice of saving it with transparency or without transparency. And as long as I save it with transparency and say save, I'm going to call this white... Transparent. You click save. Now when I go to PowerPoint, I'm going to go back to that slide we did a minute ago. This is my one with my white background. Let's let's make this background a different color so you can see it. Oh, stop. Let's make it pink. Okay, so this is the one with the white background that I painted to make it softer. And now I want to go ahead and insert the one that's transparent. See the difference? Now, obviously still on a pink background or something that's really dark, 
can look kind of strange, but I can, I, I have some control. The other thing that I can do now in 2008 uh, or 2007 is I can actually control the transparency of the image itself. So I would probably knock that image back a little bit. And do you see how simple it is to, to get rid of that rectangular shape, create a transparent file? And now the nice part is, no matter what I turn this, this background to, that image is transparent. The other one that I painted the white border on worked, but it only worked on a white background. By using pin files, I now have all kinds of flexibility. Here, I'm stuck with this rectangle. And no matter what I do, unless I'm on white, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have these strong lines. But this, I always have this nice soft shape. And it's because all I did was save it as a pin file. Now, again, it depends on what software that you use to do it, but Photoshop Elements saves ping files. Um, so does Photoshop. GIMP does ping files. Most any of the graphics tools these days do ping files because it's becoming a very uh, cool file format for the internet. When you do web pages now, you can do that kind of transparency and stuff as soon as the browsers can keep up with uh, being able to interpret those graphics uh, consistently. Do you see how, just by creating that transparent background, now if I save this, wherever I want to use it, in future um, PowerPoint presentations, I don't have to worry about what my backgrounds are because it's nice and transparent. It's, it'll go wherever I want it to go. All of these graphics that you've seen in this presentation today, these, these men um, are just files that I have saved as pink files. And I can put them in any presentation I want and they always blend in with the background because they're transparent. And I, I don't have to worry about those rectangles. I don't have to worry about those hard lines uh, that get created by them. I just need to worry about um, their, the level of transparency that I create. Here's another example of, of an image that is just nice and soft and transparent. Wherever I put him, and whatever background I put him on, he's going to blend right in. Now, this image does not work as a rectangle. If I use this guy, he's just going to be a big square on the screen. Literally, in shape wise, it's going to be a big white square. And it just doesn't work out because it, it, he's going to dominate everything. But by creating these soft edges around him, I can blend him in wherever I need him to go. And he works out real well. Here's another example of where ping files versus these transparent GIFs. And when I change these backgrounds, the ping files look real good. The guy that's got his back, some disease on his back, it just doesn't work. But see, it doesn't matter what color I make it, this guy with a headache <laughs> works out real well. All right. Questions about ping files? They're very simple to do. Again, in Photoshop, you simply create a mask and paint out the background and save it in a file format. In Photoshop Elements, it's going to be a little bit different. Uh, in GIMP, it's going to be a little bit different, but m most major graphics packages these days have the capability of doing it. You just have to check the help files for your particular piece of software to figure out how to save the, the PNG file to get it to do that. Custom backgrounds are kind of the last thing I'm going to deal with today. We may actually finish up a little bit easy early on. We'll talk about... Uh, Thank you. We'll open it up for questions and that kind of stuff if you guys have questions. Custom backgrounds to me are very important. They're the difference between uh, something that seems more canned and something that has uh, some added thought to them. I, I'm using the brand new version, the 2008 version of, 
uh, PowerPoint, so they, they've actually gotten rid of some of their backgrounds. But how many of you have seen that PowerPoint template with the mountains along the bottom? It's like a blue gradient, and it's got some mountains along the bottom. Has everybody seen that? How many times have you seen that? Like a lot. And most of the time, the presentations don't have anything to do with mountains, do they? It's just a, a canned template that comes with Microsoft Office or Microsoft PowerPoint, and it was one of the better looking ones of the canned presentations, but what's the problem? Well, last week, the preacher showed the PowerPoint and it had the mountains along the bottom. <laughs> Two weeks later, you have a guest speaker that comes in, and guess what? He's using that same background. And a month from now, somebody else, I guarantee, is going to give you a presentation, and it's going to have the same background in it, too. Uh, so custom backgrounds give you the opportunity to create distinction, to make your presentation different uh, from other people's presentations, to really give it that extra level of flair. And again, they're very easy to do if you take some time, if you learn a little bit, uh, it doesn't have to take tons of time to do it, but you can create some fun stuff. For example, this baptism one is one that I created uh, so that I would have uh, a background that made sense, kept my audience interested and engaged, and they could tell what I was talking about. Uh, many of you saw this sermon that I did. We went over this sermon in um, uh, exegesis class, but this is a background title slide that I made for my lesson on Colossians 1, on the worthy walk. And you see this background, kind of, again, looks a little bit better on the one in the back. It's just got some nice blend of color. There's some neat stuff going on. That was my title slide. This was my uh, information slide, and actually, most of my information slides did not have the cross on it. At the end of the presentation, I added the cross for some dramatic effect at the end uh, that I wanted. But you can see how soft and smooth this background is. And I can guarantee people aren't going to show up next week and use this background. And the reason I know it is because I made it. Um, so if Rick comes to visit it, he's not going to accidentally use the same template that I used because he can't. And we need to look at those kinds of things. I want to show you how to do this background really, really simple. Okay. I'm going to go into PowerPoint again. I'm going, to, um, I'm going to go ahead and close this image. I'm going to get rid of Linda in the background. So I'm going to open a file, and I'm going to open a file of my dog. That's our puppy. Aww. <laughs> That's Zoe. She likes the lake. But I want to show you that you can turn, you can make any file into a background. All I do is open an image, and the first thing I do is make it the size that I need it. So in Photoshop, you just go to image size, and you'll notice that it, the resolution, the document size, the resolution is 72 pixels per inch. That's what I need, right? And I made my dimensions 1,024 by 768. That's the size that I need it. So once I do that, I've got it now the right size. If I didn't do anything else with this image, it would fit full screen into PowerPoint. You're on Photoshop, right? I am in Photoshop. Why? Because I wanted to do it. No, <laughs> no this, is in, this is Photoshop. Now, I simply go up under filters, and I run a blur. And I use a thing called Gaussian blur. Blur is exactly what it says it is. It just makes it out of focus. And typically, you just do a little bit of stuff. But for backgrounds, what I do is I rack the focus way out. And now I've got this nice, soft background that's not a solid color. Again, if you look at the back, you can see it a little bit more. You've got this a little beige. You've got some blue-gray in it. It's just this nice sweeping um, model of color so that I can lay stuff over the top of it without any trouble. Now, that was just a picture of my dog. All I did was blur it. You can do it with any image. You just have to look at what the main colors are in the image. Um, here's, let's do another.
Here's an interesting one. This is the, this is the photograph of fireworks I took last 4th of July up in Seattle. Now, this is a vertical image, right? I don't need vertical. I need horizontal. I need this image, 1,024 by 768. Now, this is a 10 megabyte file at full resolution. So when I go to image size, you'll notice that it's 1,600 pixels by 2,200 pixels. Well, I needed 1,024 by 768 at 72, not 240. So I changed the 240 to 72. I changed the width to 1,024. Changed the height to 768. And say, okay. Now, notice what it did. It mangled my image. But do I care? I'm just trying to turn it into a background. It's the right size now for a full screen, even though it distorted it. And now if I just run the Gaussian blur again, look at it on the background. It's this nice, soft, halo-y kind of image that I can drop things into in the middle. And that's just a firework picture. Isn't that cool? Yeah. I, I mean, that, and it doesn't take any time at all. No, it's okay. You can say, yeah, everybody else is asleep. You can think it's cool. <laughs> I think it's really cool. I think it is. So, once you change it to the right size and run the blur, you can do whatever you want. Now, I'm going to go back to the picture of my dog because it's a little brighter. It's a little easier to see. The other thing that you'll notice if I go back to PowerPoint is I put these words across the top and the bottom just to reinforce uh, my story a little bit. Let's see if it makes it a little easier to see here. You can see them across the top edge of the screen. It just says, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects. I want to create this banner so that it, it, it gives a framing effect to the image. So I'm going to go back to Photoshop for a second. And I'm going to use a type tool. I'm going to just type walk in a manner worthy. Uh, I don't particularly like that typeface, so I'm going to change it to something else. I'll, I'll be honest with you, I like there's a typeface out there called Trajan. I really like Trajan because it looks very Roman and it, it just it tends to work very well uh, for Bible text and that kind of stuff because it <coughs> tends to look a little older, but it's easy to read. Is that T R A G J A N? Just like the the Roman Emperor Trajan, that's where they got the name from. And so I can I can make this smaller. I know I'm doing some of this really fast. I'm just trying to show you what's what's possible, not necessarily how to to do the mechanics of it individually. I'm going to actually repeat it a couple of times to make a nice line. And now I can put it across the top. I can copy it and put it across the bottom. <coughs> And if I think that that's too strong, if I think that's too distracting, again, in these graphics programs, you can change the transparency of these levels, uh, of these layers, just to make them a little softer so that they're there, but they're kind of screened into the background a little bit more. And now I have a nice walk in the manner worthy of the Lord background that I could use for this, uh, for this presentation. Now, the cool thing was the cross. Um, and I want to show you how I did that as well with the same background. First, I'm going to go ahead and save this as a background that we can use. I'm going to call this Zoe Background 2. And I'm going to save it as a JPEG file on my desktop. And then I'm going to show you how to actually put this into PowerPoint and use it. But I also want to create that file with the cross in it. Now, I found online, I found an image of a cross. And if 
it's on my desktop, so I just need to open it. Okay, there it is. Now you'll notice that it has a blue background, kind of a sky background. When I when I combine these two images, and I can just drag them together, because I'm just making one image, and I'm going to scale this to make it bigger, I got a problem, don't I? I'm, I'm back to that same problem that we had in PowerPoint. I got this big rectangle. And I don't want the rectangle, I just want the cross. Well, Photoshop and Photoshop Elements, those kinds of things, lets me blend these layers together with just a click of a button. So with one click of the button, darken, I can now just have the cross in there. I can make it a little bit transparent to knock it back. So that I can lay type across the top of it. And now I can save this. Now just that fast, I have my background for my PowerPoint. When I go back to PowerPoint, I'm going to create a new PowerPoint slide here. And I'm going to insert my picture. There's my PowerPoint background. <clears throat> so now I can lay whatever copy across the top of it I want. If I go back a few slides, I can find some type somewhere. Just copy this passage from Galatians. And I've got a custom background for my PowerPoint, and I can lay whatever I want on it. I can put my uh, I can put my guy with a headache on, it. <laughs> and he's going to blend right in because he's transparent. And just that fast, I have a completely custom background and slide for my presentation. And I've done a number of things. I've got my repetition of my title or my topic built into my, my slide, my background information slide. It's going to remind them that we're talking about walking in a worthy manner. No matter what I do... It's not overimposing, it's not taking up too much room, but always up there is this concept of walking in a manner worthy of the Lord. And this background is completely customizable, it's completely uh, of my own creation. And if I go, if I duplicate this slide, delete my transparent guy, and bring in my other one with the cross. Change the color of the suit. <laughs> Actually, I can. But <laughs> <laughs> and there's my slide with the cross. Looks better back there than it does up here. But see how subtle that is? I mean, it's just, it's there enough to get the drama of I'm showing the audience the cross. But I can lay copyright over the top of this, and it's not going to distract 
them at all. Now, what am I not going to do? Where am I not going to put copy across this image? Behind. I'm not going to hide his face. Don't hide his face. Even though it's, it's hard to see, people are still going to look to that spot to try to recognize and, and make connections with them. Do you have a question? Yes. When you make your original uh, colored blurred background, can you use your red or blue green sliders to change the saturation? Mm-hmm. Yep. There's, again, this is, this is more uh, Photoshop training than, than PowerPoint training. But when I create these backgrounds, And I blur her. If I want to now, I can actually control the color that it ends up being. I can move these sliders and I can make it a green background, I can make it a blue background, I can make it softer, I can make it brighter, uh, I can change the lightness. Now, some of this is easier to do in larger programs than it is in smaller programs. But just like that, I still have this smooth graduation of color. It's not just a solid color. So it breaks it up a little bit. Having that modeled color gives it a little bit more interest and a little bit more depth. Just putting up a solid blue tends to look really flat. But this, with the various colors and the shades, gives it a little dimension, gives it a little depth, and is a little easier on the eye. And so you can create an unlimited number of backgrounds just from doing this, okay? Now, Brett asked me yesterday, see I remember Brett, how do you, make, how do you use these things as backgrounds? I mean, how do you get them into PowerPoint as a background? Well, part of the problem is that it depends. <laughs> the answer is it depends on your version of PowerPoint, but it also depends on what you're trying to do. The best way to create, put an image as a background and keep it there is to do it in what's called the slide master. Uh, again, I'm using the new version, so this is going to be the same as, as PowerPoint 2007 or uh, on the Mac it's 2008. But you, you've got these master slides. And when you look at your slide master, Anything that you change in the slide master is going to, to appear throughout your presentation. And what I mean by that is I've got some typefaces here. If I want my title typeface to always be, uh, let's make my title typeface Bernhard Condense. We'll make it a little bit bigger. I want my body copy to be typewriter. And then when you click on the background, you'll notice that you have format background. If you right click on the background of your slide, even in the older version, you have format background. You can choose a picture and apply it. Now in 2007 and 2008, it's a little different. What I do is simply insert the picture at this point. So go up under Insert Picture from File. <coughs> and I'm going to select my Zoe background. And then you want to make sure that you send it to the back. Make sure that uh, it's sent all the way to the back so all this other stuff is on top. And now that image is going to be the background of every slide that I do. I'm going to make the title uh, type a light color because the background is a little darker. Okay, so now if I go if I go back to my normal view, I'm not looking at my slide master anymore. See, I've got my title type is the right typeface.
and my graphic is on the background. If I add a new slide to this presentation, if I go up and just insert a new slide, I've still got the same background in all of them. Because it's on the master, it's going to appear in all of them. Does that make sense, Brett? Yeah, I think so. Now you can also, when you fill the background, you can choose a fill. You can choose a picture as the fill, and it will do basically the same thing. I don't like doing it that way because it's, it's much harder to edit later on. It's much easier now to just go back and change your master. And here's, here's the, the situation. I'm going to add a few uh, slides here. This is slide number two. I'm going to go ahead and insert another one. I'm going to change the layout a bit. And you can see now that I have my title slide, I have a second slide, I have a third slide, and they're all different formats, but they all have that same background. If I go to my master slide again, let's say I decide that the, the background with the cross is just overpowering. I can go to my slide master, I can select that graphic and delete it, and I can just do the same thing again, insert picture. that it's all the way in the back. And now when I go back to my slide view, it's changed the background on all of the slides. So it's, it's completely customizable. If you go to the slide master, you just change the graphic. It changes every slide. You know, one of the things I'm trying to show you here is don't feel like you have to be in the habit of, I, you know, my slide presentation for this class is 170 some odd slides. If I decide to change the background, you shouldn't have to go to each individual slide and import the picture and send it to the back on every single slide. If you do it in the master, it'll update all of the, the slides. Now, because it's on the master, I can't select this background and do anything with it. It's, it's part of the master slide. So I can't click, I, now that I'm in these individual slide views, when I click on the background, I don't get the picture to delete it and change it. I have to edit it in the master. Now, what if I have a slide that I don't want the master background to be on? Well, I just simply have to cover it up. One of the best things you can do is just select a, a rectangular shape and draw a full screen rectangle around it and cover it up. And now that particular background is different. It's still got the master background underneath it. If I click and drag it, you'll see it now. I mean, I, I can pull it out of the way and you can see that that master slide is still in the background. All I've done is hidden it from your view for now because I have one particular slide where I don't want that master background. Now, 2007 and 2008 PowerPoint have created ways to do multiple masters. Um, you can have multiple master slides at once. Uh, I have not played with that feature, uh, so I can't really demonstrate it for you. But I understand now you can create these multiple masters so that those backgrounds uh, can be swapped out. Did that help at all, Brett? That's cool. Question. When you draw that rectangle, cover your existing master. Can you import whatever you want to onto that, say, that light field blue background? Sure. At this point, I just leave that as the background in any picture that I bring in. Like a clean palette. Sure. It, it's, it's, I mean, you got to recognize that it's a big square. Uh, so it is, it is there. But as long as it's full screen, I can put anything now on top of it I want. And, it, and let me demonstrate this this technique in action. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close this because I don't really need that PowerPoint file. 
You'll notice these, um, I'm in my class presentation. I'm talking about these backgrounds. If I click these and drag them, look what's behind it. It's actually my master slide template of using PowerPoint more effectively. All I've done is taken these graphics and made them full screen so that I can show you these different backgrounds. But if I go up now and look at my slide master, there's my slide master. That graphic is on every slide in this presentation, whether you saw it or not. And most of the time, you didn't see it, because I didn't want you to see it. But when I went back to a normal slide, um, it was there. It's just hidden. Here's another one where I can just grab this graphic, pull it out of the way, and you can see that 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 slide is back there. So, questions about creating some of these graphics? I tell you what, doing this blur thing is the most fun. It takes all of three minutes. It really does not take long. But when you start looking at some of the interesting photos, and, and I don't know how many of you take photos, but even photos of your kids and stuff, um, you, you can create these cool backgrounds that, that really have a neat effect. Here's, a, here's another example of that Zoe one that we made blue. I have another photo here. of this old woman's hands on a Bible. Now, by itself, this image is almost not usable in PowerPoint. Why? You cover up the hands. I'm sorry? Because the whole picture is basically the hands and you don't want to cover up the hands. Okay, th that would be one of the problems is anything that you lay over the top of it is going to obstruct the, the view of the hands. <laughs> That's really what I wanted to get to, is that the areas of dark and light are too dramatic. And so if I try to put text over this, if I use a light colored text, it's going to be readable over here, but it's not going to be readable over here, right? If I use a black text, it's going to be maybe readable over here, but it's not going to be readable over here because it's too dark. So... It's a cool photograph, and, you know, for a sermon, the idea of longevity of Bible study, how it's a heritage. I mean, there's all kinds of things you could do with this image, but it's really almost not usable the way it is. But if I simply drag it onto this Zoe backdrop that I made and change it a little bit, I can screen it back to the point where now, I mean, I know it's hard for you to see it uh, up front. Again, kind of peek at the back monitors. Now when I put white type over this, have any trouble reading that, do you? I mean, I still get the impact of the graphic. I still have the hands in the Bible. But I'm not obscuring my type. Now, if I, if I change that layer back to just normal, you see what I mean about trying to read that? Steady your... And then this part just goes away. You just can't read it. But just by screening it back and adding it to a, to a different background, I still keep my graphic. I still keep somewhat of the impact of the graphic. Maybe not as much as I do when it's by itself, but enough. But I can increase the readability of my message. What's the most important part of here? 
It really is my message. It's what I'm trying to say. Now, the graphic helps support that, but it's unusual that the graphic is the message. There's times when it is, but the graphic is there to support your message. If you can't read the message, the graphic doesn't make sense because they can't make that connection. So simply use techniques like this to create these backgrounds where things are a little bit softer. Do you see how that allows you some, some flexibility? <clears throat> I could do something very similar directly in PowerPoint now. I'm just going to insert this picture of this uh, hand right into a slide. And now, because PowerPoint allows you to control the transparency of the image, I can screen those hands back. That used to be very hard to do in PowerPoint. Again, maybe better to look at it in the back. And that's a little busy with the cross and everything. That used to be very hard to do in PowerPoint uh, to create transparency in your images that way. Uh, it's gotten better the last couple of versions, and now the new versions, it's real simple. You just, it's just a slider that you grab. But that's an option for, for toning down these images. You download these images. You don't need them to be full, full color, full contrast. Just give them a little bit of transparency, and it gives you more options. You can make them less imposing, but you can keep the visual impact. Graphics aren't question. Would it, would it be advisable or not to take the cross, move it up and to the left, where most of the vertical and most of the one arm was off, but you can still tell what it was, bring it up a little bit, and then drop the text sure. onto the other arm of the cross? Would that be sure. Yeah, there's lots of ways you can play with it. Now, he's facing left. So, or right, excuse me. So I would want to make sure that I kept him on the left half of the screen in this particular image because I want him to lead you, and even the bar of the cross is going to lead you back to the center. But I could also flip him over um, and turn him the other way if I wanted to <coughs> and, and put him on the other side. So there's, there's lots of choices. So what am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that PowerPoint gives you the opportunity with a little extra work and, a, and some new skills to make it completely customizable. You can do what you want. And I'm not saying that you have to be a master graphic designer. You'll notice what I did, I did very quickly, and in most cases I didn't really manipulate the image as much except to run a big blur on them. So you can create these environments that are customized without a lot of extra effort, but give each presentation its own sense of feel. If I want to use color, there's nothing worse in my mind, and this is, okay, Mike's opinion, nothing worse than white background slides. They're stark, they're very bright in, a, in an auditorium environment. They tend to, to, to be very contrasty, and you don't have to go there. I mean, you don't have to go crazy with color in the background, but even just something soft, just something subtle to, to make it not quite that stark white light bulb on the wall is much better. And so just by taking a picture of your dog or a picture of your kid and running a blur on it and throwing it in the background is going to give you some feel and some look then you'll be surprised at how much it's going to improve the overall presentation of your, your slides. So, some graphic design rules that I want to reinforce. Whenever possible, try to eliminate hard edges. Rectangular images are fine, but they create these boxy walls that your eye keeps running into. Number two, don't distort images whenever possible. I realize that there are times when you have to, but bottom line is, don't do it if you don't have to. And if you distort people, scale them proportionally. In other words, make sure that you're not squishing them in one direction or another. 
Make the entire image the same size larger or the same size smaller. Don't just grab the sides and squeeze it in or squash it down. Keep people's facial proportions the same. We're looking for recognition. As, as audience members, you want to relate to that person on the screen. When he looks like this, you don't relate to it. it. I mean, it just doesn't look right. And so you may as well leave it off the screen. And number three, make sure that you're understanding at least the basics of resolution. If you start out with a, an image this big, you cannot make it the entire size of the slide. It doesn't work. You have to look for larger images. Now, one of the things, one of the habits that you can do, and I, I neglected to mention it, I just remembered to mention it. If you're going to use Google Images, one of the neat things is that at Google Images, things when you use Google Images is when you're looking at these images, it tells you how large they are. Do you see that along the bottom of the images? It's kind of hard to see on screen. But like this very first one, House for Sale, is 400 pixels by 327 pixels. Is that very big? What size do I need it if I want it full screen? 1,024 by 7. Right, 1,024 wide. This one's 400. So what does that tell you? It's not even half of the width of your slide. It's actually about a third, right? So right away you know that it's not that big. And 327, you need it 768 tall, so it's not even half. Uh, well, it's a little over half of the height that you need. Now, in Google Images, you have a, a pull-down right up here under the title bar. Notice it says, All Image Sizes. Well, I don't want all image sizes because you know what? I don't want teeny tiny ones. So I want large images or higher. Now, look at this, this House MD. It's an ad for a TV show, I realize. What's the size of it? 1152 by 864. Can I use that full screen? Yeah. I can use that without any problem, right? I actually have to make it a little smaller, uh, but that's okay. Look at some of these other ones. Here's one that's 1024 by 993. Well, to use it full size, I'm going to have to crop the top and bottom a little bit, but that's probably going to work out fine. So by changing the image showing to larger images, you don't have to weed through all the images that are too small. And what happens is typically everybody has it set on all image sizes, and they find this really cool one that I really like, and it's 150 pixels by 280 pixels. But I'm going to use it full screen. And I'm going to take that little tiny image, and I'm going to stretch it because it's the one I want. Well, just avoid the temptation. Make sure that you're showing yourself large images or higher, and now you can search through, and you're going to find plenty to choose from, typically. And you don't have to worry about distorting the image. You can create it full size. What should the pixels be for full screen? 1,024 by 768 at 72 dpi. Questions? No questions? 1,024 by 768. And you, you probably do want to write that down. There's a little event next Thursday that uh, you may need that. Now, what determines the size that, since we're finished and you guys don't have any questions, I'm going to keep going. What determines that 1,024 by 768? I mean, why did I pick that size? You know? Mm -hmm. 
Normal size for what, though? The PowerPoint. You use a basic slide. Okay, for PowerPoint, that's, that's the size of the slide. Why did they choose 1,024, 768? That's the size of most screens. Okay. And it's also the size that most projectors project. You've got to recognize that your hardware is what's determining all this. 1,024, 768 used to be full monitor size. Most monitors, the highest they could go was 1,024, 768. It started out with 800 by, actually, it started out with 640 by 320. 640 by 320, yeah, something like that. Then it moved up to 800 by 600 pixels. And projectors could project 800 by 600. And guess what the standard slide size was in PowerPoint? 800 by 600. Now the average monitor is 1,024 by 768. And so projectors have, the technology has improved, and now they can project an image 1,024 by 768. My monitor right now on my laptop will go to 1,400 by 920. But the projector can't project that way. And so I have to actually change the resolution on my computer screen to match the PowerPoint projectors in order to show you PowerPoint. I can't just project 1400 by 920 because the projectors can't do that. So your hardware is what's determining the size. Right now, 1024 by 768 is right. Two years from now, it may be 1270 by something else, and, you know, as the technology increases. So you just have to recognize that. But 1024 768 is going to be good for quite a while. Questions, comments? Now's your chance. Okay. Then we're dismissed. <laughs> we don't want to leave. We just... <laughs> <laughs> just start, yeah. Tuesday, we're going to deal with um, websites, blogs, podcasts, all of that kind of stuff, and... Uh, then Thursday you will have your final exam.